ladies and gentlemen. Presented by the WZWA Network. It's the Insider Edge Podcast with your host, California. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Insider's Edge Podcast here on the WZWA Network. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California Inferior. It's a joy to be with you all once again. And speaking of a joy right here, right now, I get to speak to a guy I've always wanted to talk to. And uh, now that I, I made like a, a, a new Facebook account just for networking, I managed to get in touch with a whole bunch of people. And this guy very recently, very pumped up to talk to the one, the only, the incomparable Mr. Johnny Cashmere. How are you, sir? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So you're awesome. on the West Coast of Australia or America? Of Australia. I thought so. Okay. Got it. Yes. We're, we're very isolated over here in Perth. Uh <laughs> All the uh, other cities are on the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> um, but gotcha. it's, it's, it's great to have you uh, on the show, bro. And um, the first question I always have on the show, Johnny, is uh, before you got into the wrestling business, how did you become a fan of pro wrestling? Uh, actually, I was probably three or four years old and I would uh, get babysat by my grandmother and my uh, aunt. Uh, and they would watch wrestling like every night, like Saturday night. Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, Monday night, you know, so every, no matter what night I was there, wrestling was on. And um, after a while, I just, I don't know, I guess I saw the way, I saw the reaction it got out of my grandmother, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, like it's making her happy. It's making her mad, it's making her excited, you know, and I, I guess, I don't know, part of me wanted to make my grandmom react like that. So I guess at a young age, I learned that uh you know wrestling has a, a strong acting component to it which is something i always enjoyed anyways so right cool so it, it's yeah I, I know exactly how you how you feel um because th those were the feelings that i used to get from uh wrestling back then um i still get it now here and there but not not as uh, passionately as it did back then uh, <laughs> uh so okay it, it stayed with you you were bit by the bug eventually there's some point you know where you decide okay uh, I want to go for this. I want to only get involved in the business. How did you go about finding your way in? Uh, I was a big fan of Sonny, uh, WWE Sonny, you know, Tammy Sitch. And um, there was a sign on an armory near my house that said Sonny appearing live, you know, this Saturday. So I went and expected to see Sonny at a table with a line of people. Instead, I walk in and there's a wrestling ring. So you had to wait to intermission to meet Sonny. So I watched the event. And then uh, the next month when the event came back, I went back. It, it pulled me back in. Not for Sonny the second time, for the matches the second time. And I um, asked the guy running the event was a guy named Donnie B. I asked him about how I got in, would get into the business. And he went into the locker room and got the pit bulls from ECW, Gary Wolf and Anthony Durante, and said, yo, pit bulls is a guy outside asking, a kid outside asking, about joining school i know you just started a school and then i talked to them and that's how i ended up joining uh, a school and then years later without even realizing it donnie the same man that sent me to the pitbulls uh cast c-a-s-t cast me and trent as the backseat boys without remembering that i was the kid he sent to school <laughs> wow crazy stuff and uh so uh how did you find the uh training experience it was rough, man. Uh, you know, at that point, I had played baseball, but never to the exertion. I never played a sport that exerted you the way wrestling did. And I remember going in the ring and, and you know, running in place and then falling on my back and then getting up and running in place and falling on my back and having to do it over and over and over and over again. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I might puke, you know, and I thought if I puked, I'd be a laughing stock. And at one point, Gary says to me, do you feel like you have to puke yet? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, go puke. So I go outside, I puke, I come back in. He says, all right, how many more you have to do? And I'm like, he wants me to do more? <laughs> okay. So I jumped in and did more. And he said to me years later, he says, Johnny, you know, he says, uh, when you were outside puking, he said, I was like, oh, this kid don't have it. It, it ain't going to work. He goes, but when you actually got in and bumped again, I said, you know what? I'll give this kid a chance. He goes, and, and you ended up making me proud. So. He just told me that not too long ago. <laughs> oh, that's cool to hear. Um, I, I, I do the best of my research, uh, uh, and sometimes the internet can be right, it can be wrong. Uh, what I've got written down here is 23rd of May, 1998, against a guy named 
uh, Diego Spice for WWSA at the Derby Firehouse in Bordenton, New Jersey. Is that the first match? It is. I am utterly amazed. Let me tell you something. That's before I was even trained. I did that match. Really? <laughs> Somehow I ended up doing some matches before I was trained. Like I hadn't started, I didn't, I didn't actually train with the Pitbulls until like September. And this match was in like May. And then I had a match in June and I had a match in July and uh, was not trained. And, uh, but the guy I was wrestling in that Diego Spice was a friend from my town from here in Burlington city, New Jersey. I grew up with him. We always used to mess around and wrestle anyway. So they let me and him wrestle each other. But after that, and that was the next show too, but then the show after that, they let me wrestle the other guys in the locker room. And I think that's when they figured out like, yo, this kid's not trained. What are we doing? You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great stuff. Uh, and how did it go? Uh, considering that you weren't trained. It was cool. Like uh, the guy that managed me, my friend, Max Mack ended up uh, managing wife beater uh, for years. Uh, and he actually did a thing uh, in that match where he was my manager and we did this whole spot that we just made up on the fly um, where, uh, you know, me and the guy lock up, I was the bad guy and, and he arm dragged me. So I get up saying, Oh, you know, my shoulder and get him away from me ref. And my manager rubs my shoulder, you know? Oh, okay. Okay. So now I'm the bad guy, obviously lock up again. He hip tosses me. So now my back's hurt. So I go to the manager, he's massaging my back, you know, blah, blah, blah. We lock up a third time. He, uh, we do something. He ends up hitting me in the nuts. So I turn around to my manager asking for the, the massage. He says, no, 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 no. The crowd laughs. The other guy comes and like kicks the rope while it's between my legs and we do a whole thing. And somehow it worked. And I've used it in so many backseat boys matches since then. And it's something I had thought of before I was even trained as a wrestler. So I don't know. <laughs> Weird. That's very cool. Uh, so, okay, speaking of the backseat boys, um, uh, the, the team's forms quite early into your career of with yourself and Trent. Uh, first question, how did you two decide on the name for the team? That's that's the thing about being cast I was talking about earlier. We didn't. Uh, Donnie B, the, the guy that sent me to wrestling school, was the booker for NWA New Jersey, which back then was pretty much the biggest indie in the United States. And uh, they would run all over New Jersey every week, you know, two, two events a week. You know, it was huge. And they'd run, they'd have thousands of people, some shows. Um, and uh, so Donnie decided he wanted to do a backseat boys, a backstreet boys ripoff characters. And in his mind, it was going to be four guys. And uh, he had, we got word through, I think, Mike Keener, the referee, that Donnie wants you and, and Trent, me and Trent. And we showed up to an event and went up to Donnie and said, hi, I'm Johnny and you know, Trent, blah, blah, blah. And, and he just was like, yeah, you, you guys are it. That's great. Like he didn't even, ask, didn't even ask if I was like how long I wrestled or, you know. Oh, something's gone wrong here. I don't know if you can hear me. Because we wrestled like kind of like a brother tag team. And that I'm not trying to see that makes me sound conceited. I'm not being conceited. Okay. I have a very discerning eye for wrestling. I can look at something and tell if it's good or not and why, you know. And me and Trent were good, you know. And uh I don't know where the chemistry came from. I, I we were just so similar upbringings and heritages, the Italian in us, the the way we were both, uh, our fathers had very similar situations. Um, that's the best I can figure. I don't know why we had such tag cohesion, but thank God we did um, because, um, you know, tag is my lifeblood. You know, I'm trying to be a singles wrestler now, but I'm a tag wrestler. So I'm trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> right, and I get you. Uh, and, you know, quite early on with you, with you guys, I... Uh, you're quite spoiled for talent that you got to work with. Uh, Nick Mondo, Russ Haas, uh, Nick Gage, Rick Blade. Uh, I know you, you, you did a bit of stuff with Messiah as well. Um, a lot of you guys uh, during those days, very ahead of your time, I, I would say. 
Uh, could you speak to that a little bit and, and and kind of that crew of people? Sure. Yeah. Um, that Briscoe brothers were, mm. were in that group. Um, SAT were in that group. Um, yeah, there, it was a group of guys that it's like, it was like we were all held together by a common like, like gravitational pull is, is what it felt like, you know? And um, we all encouraged each other. You know, sometimes you're at locker rooms and guys watch other guys' matches just kind of hoping they're going to mess up. You know, there was nothing like that here, you know, in, in with all those guys. You know, it was a camaraderie. It was, uh, there was a heart and soul to it. You know, it's like I, I say, how do I say it? You know, you've heard it said where uh, you add things up together and then they're greater than the sum of the parts. Like somehow it takes on something even better and bigger, you know, and that's kind of like what happened with all the, with all of those guys, with me, with Trent, with, you know, all the guys you just named and then some, you know, Justice Payne, Max Smack, Wife Beater, John Zandig, Lobo. I mean, we can just keep on going. Yeah. And um, it was like a, it was like a box of Crayola crayons. Every color was different and every color was necessary. And all together as a pack, it just worked. For some reason, it just worked. Absolutely. And uh, another exciting time in your career, which I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing about. 2001, uh, you make your first and second tours of Japan for Big Japan. Uh, you get to work with guys like Shadow and uh, Kentaro Kanemura and uh, Raiji Yamakawa, uh, teaming with Jun Kasai uh, and even beating Raiji Ito for the junior heavyweight title. Uh, during your second tour there, I believe. Uh, how, how was the experience in Japan, you know, uh, so early on in your career? Yeah, it, it's early is right. I was, I'm trying to think how old I would have been. I had to have been like 21, maybe. Wow. And it was my first time ever on a, first time ever on a plane, you know, and luckily I remember I had three seats and I could lay down the whole way there, but I, I was sick the whole way there. Totally sick. I was puking. I felt terror. I had a fever. And it was probably my nerves. Looking back, I think it was probably my nerves, you know, but it could have been jet lag or whatever. or what, I don't know what it was. Um, anyway, I get there and I have to wrestle Shadow, their heavyweight champion. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, I'm a tag kid. And that put me against the heavyweight champion. And I'm not even a singles wrestler. And, and that's the thing. I came right out of training into tagging with Trent. It's not like I had time to go out and be a singles wrestler. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway... Uh, where was I? So we're in Japan, tagging singles. Where was I? Um, you mentioned what? Sorry, I lose my train uh, of thoughts. Uh, puking, um, uh, Raiji Ito, Junkasai. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get there. Yeah, yeah. So Shadow, they put me against the heavyweight, the champion. Yes. So I get there and I'm sick. And I get off the plane and they literally drive me to the building. <laughs> and and then the show already started your main event i'm like oh my god <laughs> so i think we ended up doing like eight minutes right i was sick i probably looked tra terrible in the ring you know i probably did and i remember little masa one of the um fans who could speak english and we're all talking and out of nowhere he says you know man the magazine is a, is bullshit you are a good wrestler you know <laughs> and i'm just kind of like yeah yeah thank wait, what? <laughs> the magazine said I'm not that good? What? And he had to explain it all to me. And I'm like, dude, I was sick. Like, I was so sick, you know? But then the next week, they apparently they were like, okay, it was a fluke. He's good or something. I don't know. I couldn't read it myself. So, but it, I thought it was funny. <laughs> awesome stuff. Do you have any other tales of your time over there? Yeah, I mean, it was the sort of thing where days between matches the the gym that you could work out at to lift was pretty far away so you'd have to like walk pretty far to do that um there wasn't a lot of stuff you could eat that was safe like you bite into a donut there's like fish inside of it you know right. the, it was just weird you know so so you couldn't you had to be careful you know and um like we we had a vcr that we could split amongst like the four of us so like every night someone would get the vcr so you could go like four stops on the train and get like 10 VHS tapes they were back then to rent. Um, so we would do that. We would rent all the um, FMW shows with all the ECW guys there, like the Pitbulls. So we were over there studying tapes of FMW and ECW on days we weren't wrestling for Big Japan. That's so good. That fun. was cool. 
Yeah, that's cool. Uh, okay, so we, we, we've heard about the trip to Japan and it sounded like it was, you know, a bit of a, a success despite the uh, fishy donuts. Uh, but um, August 21st, 2002, uh, yourself and Trent work the 11th NWA TNA pay-per-view at the Tennessee State Fairgrounds. Uh, it's like a gauntlet for the gold type thing with uh, America's Most Wanted, the Hot Shots, and the Disciples of the New Church, as long as as well as the Backseat Boys. Uh, it always confused me as to why you two never appeared there again. Um, uh, can, can you let me know about uh, what happened with uh, TNA? Yeah, I, I don't know for sure why we didn't appear again. Um, I'll tell you my speculation. We were young and probably arrogant and stuck up and probably looked at it like, hey, you know, we're the backseat boys. They're lucky to have they're lucky to have us. Like we probably had that attitude. I don't know for sure. But I remember after the match, us going out back and just blatantly smoking weed with some guys in the locker room in front of people. And you know, guys that are already part of the locker room, that's one thing. But like guys that are there on a tryout and that's they're they're like that full of themselves that they're just gonna be blatantly like like I'm glad they didn't bring us back because we probably would have messed up on national TV or something, you know, stupid. Um, but I think we got stooged out by somebody for uh for smoking weed out back. That's my guess, but I I don't know. Right. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's that's I, I find that funny, but <laughs> uh <laughs> <laughs> uh so okay like the, the run with czw uh seems to be you know quite fruitful uh is there an angle um from your time in czw uh that you're most proud of yeah actually uh the whole high five thing i loved um but um we did an angle once where i put um someone in a full nelson and it wouldn't be able to be broken and two guys hit the ring and punched me and i didn't let go and then they hit me in the back with chairs and i didn't let go after like six shots then they hit me in the head twice i still didn't let go i pretty much passed out uh, my high five boys came out and saved me and it led up to a match that night but i love that angle like it just got it, it really like if i'm a superhero the the only superpower I have is my pain tolerance. And it really helped get my pain tolerance over and extend my unbreakable gimmick to like the next level in, in the fans eyes and stuff. Um, so I think that was my favorite angle um, that I did, but uh, most people would expect me to say like my feud with Zandig, you know, that led it in the cage of death five, stuff like that, which was awesome. I love doing all that stuff. Um, and looking back, it made me not only the wrestler I'm today, it made me the man I am today. So, you know, I actually owe a lot to to Zandig and, and the time back then. Um, and it's funny because uh, it was tough love. It wasn't, you know, me and Zandig did not get along that well for years uh, back then. Um, rubbed people, rubbed each other the wrong way, et cetera. And um, a lot of it, I realized, was probably my fault. Uh, just a young, arrogant prick, you know. Um, and John's not the kind of guy that's going to stand for that. And uh, I've learned a lot from him over the years on how to act as a as a man. So. Sorry, I, that, I don't know why I ended up there. but No, that's okay. It, it is interesting because, like, I don't know what I was like in my early 20s. I was a dickhead. Like, you know, I could, I could, I could, I'm not surprised that I didn't keep many jobs that I had back then and things like that because I didn't, you know, I was just like, nah, whatever. I just want to get drunk, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yep. I, I get it, you know, and, and with time uh, comes that wisdom and you, you learn those lessons and, you know, things happen. Uh, and I don't mean mm -hmm. to skim through too much, you know, I don't want to take up no. too much of your time because we, we could talk all Whatever. night about all the different things that you've done through your career. Uh, one particular angle that I was interested in asking about, uh, I think I've only had the chance to ask one other person about this, but uh, the Ring of Honor uh, versus CZW angle, the uh, you know, it's, pre it's a pretty cool angle to to uh, put together, although it can be quite difficult with the politics and all that. Uh, what did you think of that angle and how it went? Um, I don't, you're probably aware I was not in CZW at, or Ring of Honor at that time. I was in Pro Wrestling Unplugged, my own right. company, and we were running at the same building as CZW, the ECW Arena, the 2300 Arena. Um, so I didn't see it. I didn't really follow it. It was right. like the competition, you know what I mean? So it was like, I didn't really pay attention. Like people would tell me, oh, this happened, that happened, this happened. It seemed over. I mean, it seemed like the crowd was was into it and stuff. Crowd crowd really got into it. Um, 
So, yeah, I don't know. But I, to be honest with you, I don't know much other than what I heard back then. I've never seen it. Right. Um, and I don't, that's have, my I don't really have mem memory. I don't have memory of it either, unfortunately. Right. Much. That's, okay. that's that's my bad. I, I thought I read something that you were a part of that angle, but um, I guess you weren't. So No, but you have been you have been what what as in the show, the movie, My Cousin Vinny says you have been dead on balls accurate about everything up until now. And I'm impressed with some of the things you've known. So one little hiccup like that, brother, we're <laughs> going to let it slide just this once. Okay. <laughs> no problem, bro. Uh, okay. Yeah. So here's another thing. Uh, so you did work for ring of honor. You did though, right? You did. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Quite a bit. Uh, I have to yeah. ask you about this because I'm pretty sure that this was the match, but again, I, I'm always worried about the internet being wrong. Uh, November 1st, 2003, there's a scramble cage match and and uh, there's the thing with, with Teddy Hart jumping off the top of the cage and all that. I've never had the chance to talk to anyone about that. So when I saw that it might have you might have been in this particular match, I needed to know your side of the story. Yeah, I was in that match, definitely. Um, I had no memory of stuff either. You know, it's so weird. Um I watched it recently. I don't know how I found it online or something. And someone showed it to me and it's a good match. And I'm me and Trent looked really good in there and everything was awesome. And I don't remember any of it, like none of it. I remember him coming off the top, Teddy uh, at the end, but at the moment, like the, sh the match is over. We're outside. He's climbing to the top. He jumps, you catch him. And my mind is thinking, he must have called that in the back and I just didn't hear it. It didn't occur to me that he's going off script and trying to do his own shit. And then he climbs back up there and he starts throwing up like into the crowd and said, bouncing all over the place. There's chunks of puke and shit. I mean, it was nasty, you know, and he puked in the ring too, I think. So, um, you know, it's bad enough having to wrestle after people sweat and bleed in a ring, but you don't want, you know, puke too. Um, but yeah, he, you know, I guess he just kept jumping and, and God, we kept catching him. I know I caught him. I know uh, Jose Maximo, Kelvin uh, caught him. Um, you know, we're not going to let the dude die. I mean, I don't even think there were mats on the ground. He just was just jumping off the cage. Picture perfect too. I mean, like Olympic style dives, you know, like, you know, you'd hold up a 9.5, you know, um, but it, you know, you should let people know ahead of time in wrestling, there's an etiquette. You don't just jump on someone, especially when your own life is in that kind of danger. It was just bizarre. It was just, it was just a bizarre occurrence. Where do you even categorize it? That's why we're still talking about it. Cause it was so unique and odd. Yeah. Cause the, I've never really been able to understand it and I've seen him talk about it, but you know, when he's talking, you never know what the truth is or, or and whatnot, just based off, you know, history, but, you know, I, I believe he said like he, he was, he was concussed and he didn't really know what he was doing. And I mean, that might be true. Cause if he's, why would he be throwing up everywhere and, and, and puking? Um, but it seemed like everyone was quite mad with him and threw all of his uh, gear out of the locker room. It, it sounded like a bit of a dramatic situation there, but I don't know. I just thought it's one of those oddity things that, you know, has happened in the history of pro yeah. wrestling. Yeah, I wasn't involved in the locker room thing. I, I'm not sure for if this was the night or not, but Teddy and, and Jack would stay at my house when they came in uh, to Philly. So I, I don't know if, I think this show was like in North Jersey or something. So I don't think they may not have stayed with me that weekend. So it's not like, so in other words, if he gets kicked out of the locker room, it's not like I had to go be like, oh, Teddy, go wait in the car. Here's the keys or anything. Like we weren't attacked like that. But I do remember I didn't kick him. I wasn't one of the guys that kicked him out of the locker room. I at this point, I thought Teddy was like a savior for the area of pro wrestling. Like he mm. came out of nowhere with the heart name and he was just doing it his own way. And I found it inspiring as hell, you know, and, you know, sit with him, smoke weed with him, get high. You're listening to his bullshit. Sometimes it just it sounds perfect. And, and I don't even mean to say his bullshit because a lot of what he says is true uh, and good. He, he's not insane. He's just. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, he just he just colors outside the lines too much, you know, something like that maybe. But he's talented mm. and he's not an evil. He's not even an evil human being. He's not. He's really not. He's just he's got a strange upbringing, I would imagine. 
Yeah. Can you imagine what his life? Do you imagine being born into a family like that and the yeah. pressure you're under from day one and how that must feel? You know, that's enough to make anybody, uh, you know, different. Yeah, he is different, definitely. Um, I don't know how he gets the cat. You know, his cat. I don't know. I don't know how he gets the cat to do. Th- what my cat that I used to have would freak out being outside the house. I find that impressive. Uh, aside from the rest, I don't know his methods. I don't. Yeah, I don't know his methods. So as long <laughs> as he's not harming them, then yes, it's a miracle. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, so I really feel like I've been skimming through uh, a lot of your your career here because I'm up to a part now where it's like a, your last match in CZW, uh, working at the Cage of Death. Uh, I believe that's what my uh, research tells me. Um, Close. This is like. Yeah, it's like 2003. It seems like after this, you kind of pull back from uh, getting in the ring and wrestling. Uh, so I just wanted to know, like, what led to the decision to be like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to step away uh, from this at this point. Uh, interesting. Um, hmm. How candid do I want to be here? Uh, I was not doing well at the time, I think. I think I was on some some stuff I shouldn't have been using. Uh, never hard drug drugs. I've never done anything crazy, thank God. Um, but you know, still, there are there's different levels of drugs. And even though I was doing a lower level, not a crazy drug, it's still a drug, you know. And um, I think I just started to um, get lost in my own head. Suddenly, working out was no longer a priority. It was just getting events, getting events off the ground. I left CZW. Uh, I didn't have anywhere to wrestle anymore. I was used to having that home that that group of guys around you that you were part of and I didn't have that anymore so I had no choice but to start it myself in PWU and um you know I I made a lot of decisions back then that were very hasty I actually used to think about you know you have to make a leap of faith I used to say if I'm going to wait for all the conditions to be perfect to start a wrestling fit I'm never going to start a wrestling fit it comes a time where you're a, a frog and you got to jump from one lily pad before the other lily pad even appears and you got to be in the air hoping and praying that it's going to appear and, and you can land on it. And that's how I started PWU. And it just kept working. And and it, and it I look back and I'm like, I made every wrong decision and it still worked. Because there was something inside of me that was connected to wrestling that just wouldn't let go and it was non-negotiable. And um, as many mistakes as I made back then, I'm getting the chance now, not a redo, but like I say, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. Everything I'm doing in my career now, I'm, I can see the signposts that I passed last time, and I see myself doing it right this time. And that, to me, makes my entire life have more meaning than it did before. Right. Well, that's excellent to hear. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to really ask you about this, uh, starting your own promotion. Um what goes into something like that uh, at that point in time? You know, we're talking about, you know, the, the mid 2000s here. Um, uh, please uh, indulge me into how you just how you go about starting something like that from scratch. Uh, yeah, uh, I was I was bartending. I didn't have a ton of money, but I had some cash flow. Um, I remember watching the TV show The Shield with Anthony Chiklis or whatever. Uh, that was his name back then, whatever. Um and it was a different kind of cop. It was a kind of cop that was almost like a bad guy as a good guy. And he was out there doing stuff. And like I said, he was he was uh, jumping before the next lily pad would appear. And I started realizing this was the universe telling me that I just have to do it. You just do it or, or don't bother, you know? So I just tried. Knowing I didn't have quite enough money, knowing I didn't have quite enough of everything together, and I swear to God, as I just started doing it slowly and building it, everything I needed appeared at the right moment. And it just all started to work together. And 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 then all of a sudden, it's like birth was given somehow and something was alive. And from that moment, it was just my job to be a steward, to maintain it. It no longer is mine. It's mine in the same sense that a child is yours. They're not really yours, but they're yours. That's how I look at PWU and that's how I look at my current company, SPO. It's only as good as the locker room and it's only as good as the gravitational pull keeping the locker room together. If that's not there, you can have a million dollars. There's no heart and soul. Lights are going to end up not staying on. 
Right. And and what would you say is kind of, you know, the uh, toughest parts of, of, of that kind of job and, and having your own promotion? Well, it's a constant force on you. Like, you know how if you put a rock in a river after time, that rock becomes smooth as hell because yeah. the river just wore it down slowly every day. That's promoting wrestling. And it's, it's whack-a-mole. And as soon as you think everything's cool, your main event pulls out. Or, or your some someone gets hurt. Or someone else gets a better booking. And, oh, my God. And then and you're trying to put storylines together and make them make sense and then you lose someone from that storyline so what do you do and it's enough to drive anyone crazy and back then when i wasn't in a great state of mental health as it is that's all i needed uh to be the straw that broke the camel's back back then and that's all it would take to get me off track and to start um making decisions out of spite or out of retribution rather than out of creativity and and love and respect which is what you know the business is not lucky to have me. I'm lucky to be a part of the wrestling business. Right. And I also read that uh, Todd Gordon was a bit involved in this as well. Uh, uh, did he, was there anything that you learned from Todd? <laughs> wow. I learned so much from Todd. Um, Todd, Gary Wolf, my trainer, brought Todd to me and put put us together and said, like, Johnny can run wrestling shows. He's proved it, but he's not run Philly that successfully yet. You know, maybe once or twice. Todd taught me how to run Philly, how to run a major city, how to run a place where um, you're competing with so many other attractions in the area. It's a completely different animal. And uh, he's the one that made the deal with the building. He's the one that, you know, Todd taught me so much. I actually lived with Todd for a period of time during PWU. Um, and we promoting PWU was like my full-time job was, was running and helping it. And, and um, but Todd, man, he was, it was our baby. PWU was our baby for years. I am still, I still consider him one of my all-time best friends, brothers. I love him. He always has my best interest in heart. He's taught me so much that he didn't have to teach me. Taking me into his home with his family and his friends. Um, his book, if you read his book, just the introduction alone, read it. And then I guarantee you'll read the rest of the book. Uh, it, it's just it's just wonderful. And, and I'm so, I don't know, I'm just so privileged to even have someone like him to take me under his wing and teach me how to run wrestling. A guy that's pretty much started ecw let's be honest so but yeah yeah Can't say no. enough good of course I, I when i saw his name uh during my research i was like oh i had no idea that well i gotta ask about todd uh <laughs> um so from again my research it, it could be wrong again uh but it says that in in, in the span of about five years you put on 48 shows uh with that company um what are your what are your fondest memories? What, right. what makes you the proud? Like what will, what kind of moments would there be that made you proudest as a promoter? Like watching um, what you've put together come to fruition, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I really liked when I had Burt Ward uh, from Batman. Uh, you know, the the nineteen sixties Batman show um, walked me to the ring and 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 dark knighted me with my baseball bat. You know, a Batman. And then got involved in my match and uh, just it, it, that meant the world to me. Uh, I, I loved it. It came out great. We had a huge crowd. Uh, it was the same night as the Crazy Eight, which is like a, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like rope swings and like a jungle gym. It's like this, I, I called it wrestling's favorite playground. Um, so it was a big event. Two Cold Scorpio was part of it. Um, and, and we had a tailgate before it. So the Crazy Eight every year would have the crazy tailgate. As much as you can um, within your budget. And, oh, sorry, bro. Uh, that's um, kind of the, the your video I actually think... froze for about. 30 seconds then. So I've missed out on a bunch of the uh, story Sorry. that you was telling. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, where did I stop? Do you know? Uh, you, you, you just mentioned the, uh, the crazy eight. 
the crazy eight yeah uh rope swing match you know yeah. and and uh jungle gyms we called it wrestling's favorite playground um two cold scorpio was in it i've never been in it myself but it was my idea just so to see it happen and to see you know to see the arena packed and and the crowd loving it and stuff and to do it multiple years it was exciting you know but that, that sounds about right 40 48 shows in, in the span of five years but that was just for pro wrestling unplugged i also had uh trademark wrestling when i was like 19 and then we had renegade wrestling when i was like 20 uh and then i think i also ran a czw event at my college um so pw was like my fifth or sixth venture into promoting um and then spo would now be one more than that so <laughs> right well, what is it about it that because you know we for me on my my end of things like i mainly thought of you as a pro wrestler i didn't really think in depth about the fact that you've done this quite a lot what what is it about being a promoter and having your own wrestling company that is just within you i think it's because God, how am I going to say this without sounding like a piece of shit? It's because I think I know better. That's what it is. Let's be honest. Because I think I know better. So I, so why take orders from someone else and have a vision that even if it's perfect, it's still their vision? I want to give the orders or not give orders, but help mastermind something that everyone's a part of. And then if it works... We all get excited about it. And I tried to do it that way. Um, you know, when we started Pro Wrestling Unplugged, the tagline was it was by the wrestlers for the wrestlers. Because I was sick of of promoters having the upper hand on pro wrestlers and, and looking down on pro wrestlers, talking down to pro wrestlers, talking down about pro wrestlers behind their back or just, you know, they get too familiar sometimes with, with wrestlers. Some promoters do. And I don't like it sometimes. So I prefer to wrestle for wrestlers. But that doesn't mean I don't like promoters. I love promoters. They're needed. They give us money to support our families. I just don't like when promoters talk down to wrestlers, look down on wrestlers, whatever. And uh, back then, when I probably had an attitude and a half, every promotion I was in, eventually someone was on my nerves for some reason. So it was like, let me go do my, I'm taking my ball and going home. Um, I'm lucky that I actually had a talent for it, you know, because I could have just failed miserably, but I didn't, thank God. And and all the, the lessons I've learned, I'm going to try to now, and I am trying now, to apply them properly. Right. Well, let's see, that that's a great answer because it's it's been a while, but I, I, I wrestled locally here in Perth in 2010 uh, to 2014-ish, four years-ish. Uh, and I just couldn't stand nice. it because the promoters thought that they knew everything. And it's like, oh, my God, man, like you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, so I completely understand because to me, it makes me think back then, gosh, I wish I was running the show here because I think I'd do a better job than this clown. But anywho, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I, I see uh, you, know, you had wrestled for a couple of years. That's again in my research, uh, but I saw that perhaps you had wrestled uh, 2006 against the Sandman. Uh, he had he had Francine with him. You had Todd at ringside. So I thought this was an interesting one to bring up on the 23rd of June, 2006. Um, you know, because Todd was at ringside. I don't know, this seemed like it was something that was kind of important. Uh, could you speak to that at all? Yeah, no, that was fun. Um, yeah, Todd had it in his mind that me. Me and Sandman would work well together. And, and it did. We, we worked well together. Um, we were similar in that uh, neither of us went out there and put on a catch as catch can wrestling match. Usually we both were more in the entertainment part of it and character uh, building um, things like that, you know, so working us against each other, it just seemed right. And in that building, it seemed right. And I prefer to be a heel. So he has to be a face in that building. I mean, he's so mm. over. Um but I, I'm pretty sure if it wasn't that night, it was one of the nights against Sandman where I actually took a bump from the top rope um, onto Legos in the wrestling ring. And that was like the first time anyone used Legos. Now everyone uses Legos. Uh, but I did that. I did a, a marbles. I dumped marbles out in the ring and someone bumped me from the top rope into it. Um, and I did uh, action figures also. And that was all during that time. Uh, it was a series month after month where they just kept, it was like from toy boxes. Just, I kept getting more stuff from like my childhood and just bumping into it. You know what I mean? Right. Ex excellent stuff. Uh, 
The following month, you team with Trent against uh, Devon Moore and Drew Blood. And then in January of 07, you're in a War Games match. Uh, it's kind of like PWU versus uh, Juggalo Championship Wrestling, which that looks fun uh, just based off the, the people that were listed to be in the match. Um, at the time... Did you did you know that these would be the two last times that you shared a ring with Trent? Because uh like he, he was still wrestling after that, but it did it seemed like you weren't uh getting back in the ring after these two matches. Um, just again based off my research. Like was that kind of like, you know, these were kind of maybe the last two matches you were gonna be having and 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 did you, you know, kind of have much contact with him after that to maybe keep working together? Yeah, we stayed, I mean, we always stayed friends. I mean, we weren't, you know, towards the end, he was, he was bad, you know, on, on, he had strayed from the person he wanted to be and it was tough to watch it, you know, and, um, but you always expect him to snap out of it, you know, and then it's like one day it's too late, you know, and that's sort of what happened with all that, you know, it was just sort of this thing where it was, it's like water and it's like trying to grab water in your hands. It's just, that's how it felt you know and i when i stopped wrestling back then it was it was cuz i was so out of shape like i just didn't care anymore i was just getting depressed I, I was depressed i you know it was just like who cares um but he kept wrestling i, I don't think like I don't, I don't think he ever totally stopped like even when he wasn't in great shape he would still take matches and still have great matches so um yeah he he sort of kept going when when i sort of stopped and uh I don't know what would have happened if he'd have stayed, if he would have lived and everything, if, if him and I would have, would have, if, if I even would have ever came back to wrestling. I have no idea. I have no idea. I never thought I'd be back this time. And mm -hmm. even when I came back, it was as a manager. And then all of a sudden I got in the ring for the hell of it and realized I could still do it. So, you know, with me, it's like, I, I just try to let one thing lead into the other, you know, um, like a twig on the shoulders of a mighty stream. You know, we go about and try so hard and struggle. And then at the end of the day, you realized you were being carried by wind the whole time and you didn't even need to struggle and back then i struggled now i'm realizing that life's not a struggle it's it's passion and when you put your passion into it um the struggle goes away because you're not struggling when you're enjoying it absolutely and uh you know you, you've, you've mentioned it a few times about you know not being in the best shape and and feeling depressed and all that and uh and uh, you know having some problems yourself what was like the thing that kind of got you out of that? It, it, was there a moment in time where you're just like, you know what, I, I've had enough of this. So I, I've got to kind of, I'm just, I'm just curious. Uh, I, I think it's like wine fermenting. It just needs to take a certain amount of time for everyone. And it's different for everyone, how long it takes. You know, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't do anything until he was 30 years old. And, and people believe he's God. So at age 21, you better believe I was making every mistake in the damn book. Um, but at the end of the day, I was worth redemption because of my pure love for the business and my pure love for people. I'm not the kind of guy who ever blows out another guy's candle to make mine shine brighter by comparison. I'm not willing to do that. Some people are. And I realize when you're not willing to do that, you sort of attract other people to you that think like you. And that's really been my saving grace is having great people around me that love me and, and that understand me. Right. Cool. Well, that's, uh, that's a great answer. And, uh, you know, I wanted to go there because, you know, there might be someone watching this that's going through something similar. So, you know, I, it, it always helps. So the more that kind of conversations out there, the more those kinds of words are heard by people, the more chance there is that it could help someone. So, um, cool. Uh, so uh, I guess I kind of wanted to uh, uh, talk a bit more about Trent uh, because obviously the backseat boys, you know, this is a big part of your, your time in pro wrestling. Um, what, what does he mean to, to your career in pro wrestling? Well, he helped train me. I mean, when I, when I came around at age uh, 18 and a half, 19, he had already been wrestling for like four years. So I think he started when he was like 14. Wow. So in a way he was like a finishing school for me, you know, like I was still learning how to bump and stuff in the ring from the trainers, 
But at night, I'd be hanging out with him and a couple other guys like him, like Billy Real, Nick Burke, and they would be talking to me as if I was a peer, and it was teaching me faster because I was around it. I was immersed in it, you know? So Trent sort of helped bring me up faster so that I was ready to tag with him. And we never expected to be a tag team. That never occurred to us that we were going to be a tag team. It wasn't even our decision. I remember one time I managed him in a match when I was still a trainer for the Pitbulls. They let me manage him in a match and the Pitbulls were running the event. And Trent said, can Johnny manage me tonight? And the, Gary said, the Pitbull, he went, he's not really ready, but you know what? Yeah. As long as you guys like have a gimmick together, then fine. But like, if he's just going out there in jeans and you're going out there in tights, there's no reason for you to be together. So no. And Trent and I at the same time reached in our bags and pulled out matching vests that we didn't even know we had. We didn't coordinate bringing it. I had never seen him in it, wear it before. He never saw me wear it. And Gary just went, oh, you do have matching outfits. Yeah, perfect. Do it. Go for it. And uh, at the end of that night, Trent said, dude, I want you to manage me all the time. I really like that. And then when Donnie, a few weeks later, asked us to show up together, we had just sort of connected. So like the timing of everything, it was like dominoes. It was just perfect. And, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We're, we're in the womb right? We're a baby in the womb. We don't worry that our nose isn't going to form on the right day. We don't worry that the cells aren't going to divide perfectly. Everything happens perfectly. Billions of cells and blah, blah, blah. And we come out and it's perfect. And it's like we say, okay, world, thank you. But now we'll take it from here. And then we mess it up. That's what I've learned. You just got to let go. You just got to relax. You know, a clenched fist makes a miserable man. But a relaxed fist, you're a happy guy. Simple as that, you know? And that, that's what I'm learning now in my second run is, is how to be a calming element on people rather than a, um, you know, I used to be anxious, make other people anxious. Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, 2023, uh, you're back. 13-year uh, absence from the ring from my research again. Uh what was it that convinced you? You know what? I got. I, I got to. Um, I got to go for part two here. Donnie B asked me. He said, "I'm doing an event. Uh, it was last year uh, in December, so we're talking eight months before that. So we're talking almost two years ago." Donnie tells me, "I'm going to do an event. It's going to be big. It's going to, you know, it's going to seat 1,800 people, and I want to do a Trent thing. Finally, like the the quintessential. Let's honor Trent right." you know, blah, blah, blah. And he made a title bell and the whole nine yards. Um, Trent's family uh, is very turned off by wrestling. As you can understand, they lost their son. And uh, they, it's more appropriate for us to, to not make them dredge up all this stuff publicly. Uh, it's more important for us to, to make that concession for them than for us to go out and honor Trent in some wrestling thing. You know, wherever Trent is right now, I think he'd much rather his mother be happy then us honor him in some event that'll happen once and then that'd be forgotten. So um, I agreed to go to, to it um, before she had said no. And then she decided not to. They changed the event from a Trent Acid tribute to a contest of champions. And um, I said, you know what? I'll still go. I gave my word I was going to go. I'll still go. You know, a lot of people are still going to be there that I want to see. And I went back and I made reconnected with everybody in Tom's River, New Jersey. And I, I met the Graysons and Two months later, uh, we're announcing the new Backseat Boys with the Graysons, and it just all happened so perfectly, and I didn't expect any of it. It's a total magic carpet ride, and it's not slowing down. It just seems to be gaining elevation lately, and lately, I've just been holding on and enjoying the view, um, and I just want to see how high this thing can go, you know, because I hit a glass ceiling before, and I think it was because of my attitude. Hmm. I'm not going to hit that glass ceiling this time, so I'm interested to see how high we go. Yeah, cool. Because I even saw that. Did you wrestle Tommy Dreamer in a cage match this year? <laughs> that's that's crazy. I wrestled Tommy in a <laughs> Tommy in a doors match. We did doors. Uh, me and HC Loke did a cage match. But oh, yeah, you're, you're right again. Good, good okay. call. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. cool, man. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the latest yeah. match, I believe, against Mojabari in Canada. If I'm right, uh, anything else in the pipeline? Anything that you want to let all the Johnny Cashmere and the Backseat Boys fans out there know about? 
Well, you know, it's like I say, me and the back seats and Donnie B, we're like action figures. We're your Batman, we're your Robin, we're your Nightwing, you know? Bo wrestling, that's your play set. That's that's the Batcave play set, you know? And um, the Batmobile, our vehicle, that that's our, our podcast. We have the Spocast. Uh, just search S-P-O-C-A-S-T, Spocast, wherever uh, podcasts are. So that's Apple and Amazon and Spotify and all that. Uh, and every Monday we do a new one, uh, me and Donnie and uh, Rob Sanderson. And then the back seats and me uh, also do an interview series with different people. We recently interviewed uh, the ESW, Empire State Wrestling Champion, Vince Valor. We interviewed Mo Jabari. We interviewed uh, Bushwhacker Luke, Bill Alfonso. And we have plenty more interviews uh, coming up soon. So we're trying to put out a lot of content. So follow me on Instagram. Uh, follow Backseat Boys on Instagram. And uh, you'll stay in touch with our wrestling company through that. Uh, so superpowers of wrestling awesome and uh all of that information all those links everybody if you're watching uh it'll be in the description on youtube when this video goes out okay uh johnny cashmere we're, we're coming very close to the end of the interview here but i want to find out about your favorite things and uh the first one here is well, the first three are about wrestling uh do you have a favorite pro wrestler of all time the undertaker nice uh yep. undertaker i through your whole career, one person that you could say was your favorite opponent? Nick Mondo. Excellent. Uh, do you have one match that you look back on and, and say, that's my favorite that I ever had? Um, Actually, believe it or not, I'm going to say me and Trent against... Josh Prohibition and M Dog Twenty. I loved that match. I don't know why. I loved it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, getting away from wrestling now. Do you have a favorite book? Right now, I'm reading the Todd Gordon book. Um, I love uh, the Celestine Prophecy. I don't know if you guys, if you've read that. Uh, I read a lot of um, spiritual books. I love Wayne Dyer. Change your thoughts, change your life. The Tao Te Ching. The I Ching. Um, all those kind of ancient wisdom, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, um, I love ancient religions and stuff like that. Oh, cool. Um, do you have a favorite TV show? Current? Uh, of all time. So probably Sopranos. Oh, excellent choice. Uh, do you have a favorite film? Batman 1989. Excellent. Very nice choice as well. Uh, do you have a favorite musical artist or band? Soundgarden. Chris Cornell, Soundgarden. Yes, bro. Love it. Uh, getting away from the arts now, favorite food? I would say my my favorite food. Uh, ooh, I, like, I do like ribs. I like ribs, beef ribs a lot. And I like um, uh, hibachi like going out to hibachi. I love that. Some fine choices there. I love some ribs myself, actually. Uh, now, I'm, and you know what? Now I'm going to end up having them for dinner. I bet you anything. <laughs> so someone says My it, mouth just it. started watering. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, favorite, <laughs> do you have a favorite place to eat on the road? Uh, yeah, I like um, Tim Hortons. I love getting coffee at Tim Hortons. And, you know, they have good breakfast sandwiches and stuff. So I'm like, I like that. Okay, cool. Uh, do you have a favorite beverage? You know, you're a bit thirsty. What's the go-to for you? Celsius. I love Celsius. Orange. Uh, I just bought a case of it today, actually. That's how disgusting uh, I am with, with it. I drink one a day. I get up. I go right to the gym. I drink my Celsius while I stretch. And by the time I'm lifting, man, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm ready to go. Um, so I love Celsius. Yeah. And I drink a lot of water, especially uh, high pH water. That's so important to have an alkalized system, I think. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, the second last one here, it can be considered a naughty one, but it could always have a meaningful answer. Uh, you know, Johnny Cashmere sees a good looking lady, you know, but what will you look at first? What's your favorite female body part or attribute? Johnny Cashmere is a homosexual. Although he has really? been with many women and can tell and can tell what is attractive in a woman and not. And I've been with many women in my life. Um, I'm card carrying member of the uh, LGBTQ. Yes, sir. Really? My bad. I did not know that. Well, 
most people don't. It's not something I wave around at parties, but it's who I am, and I, and I love myself. So yeah, why not be fine. honest about it? Okay, well, uh, that's that's say favorite male attribute or body part. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to say that. Um, <laughs> no, I'm. I... <laughs> Um, uh, for me, I, I would say uh, eyes. Take very good answer. See, yeah, it, it, that yeah, that that's that's all there is. Eyes are everything, or eyes are nothing. Very good. Uh, and the last one here, Johnny. Uh, favorite curse word. I don't think you curse. <laughs> I don't curse a lot. I really don't. Um, I try not to curse a lot, to be honest with you. Um, but I would say that the. the my least favorite would be the C word. You can't say that, you know. Um, but I would say my favorite would be uh, I, I say friggin' sometimes, you know. <laughs> uh, no, fair enough. It's it's a... Curse ish. <laughs> I curse. I'm not perfect. I curse. Believe me, I probably cursed in this interview. <laughs> well, uh, some great. I just try not there. to. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, but some great answers there. Really appreciate your time, bro. Uh, it's uh, been a joy having the uh, opportunity to talk to you today. And it's unfortunate that the interview is uh, coming to an end, but I know uh, time is ticking over there and uh, you might be wanting to uh, get yourself off to bed soon whilst I start my day because I'm on the other side of the planet. Yeah, so, Johnny Cashmere, thank you so much for your time, bro. Uh, and, and one thing I always wanted to say was, you know, um, the fact is that you've reached so far because I live in Perth, Western Australia. I'm on the other side of the planet and the most isolated city in the world. So uh, if your name managed to carry all the way over here for someone that far away to know who you are, come on, that, that's got to mean something, right? Thank you, man. That means a lot. And I, I do want to take a rain check on uh, next time you and I talk, I want to hear about your time in the wrestling business, brother. That surprised me to hear. I want to hear about that. <laughs> cool, bro. Definitely will. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank all of you out there for joining us here on the Insider's Edge podcast. I'm California. That was Johnny Cashmere. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Network, that's the way we blind. Get puppies. Hey, hey, network, that's the way we blind. Get all of us are paid for by the WZWA Network.